impression was that it was a, a phenomenon, like it was a phenomenon from another planet. Russia was the best country to go to, because there they have a spontaneous reaction to genius. To get uh, international recognition, you couldn't miss Russia. You would have to appear in Russia. Because Russia has always been a very musical country. December 27th, 1955. To the Honorable Lester B. Pearson, Department of External Affairs. You are no doubt aware that plans have been completed for a Canadian concert tour of Russian musicians in March of 1956. Just recently, some of these musicians, Mr. Gilels and Mr. Oistrach, have appeared with great success in the United States. I was wondering why such tours could not be reciprocated. I am the exclusive manager of Glenn Gould, the greatest pianist that Canada has ever produced. Yours sincerely, Walter Homburger. I think curiosity was one of the reasons he wanted to go. Another was that his career had come very suddenly into the public prominence with the Goldberg Variations. He was already very well known in Canada. He was becoming very well known in the United States very quickly. And the idea of going to the Soviet Union at that time as the first Canadian was pretty exciting. Department of External Affairs Memorandum. I think that it is desirable for us to encourage the odd concert artists from Canada to play in the Soviet Union, though we should try to ensure that nothing less than our very best go. They will not stack up against such musicians as Gilels and Oistrach, but if they can put on a respectable performance and play a bit of Canadian music, I think their visits would have some value. I am afraid that I just do not know whether Glenn Gould can be included among the foremost Canadian musicians. I think you might suggest to Homburger that he get in touch with the Russian Embassy direct and keep us informed of his plans. R.A.D. Ford, European Division. They were quite unaccustomed to the notion of being involved in a, a cultural tour. And in some of the early reactions, there's even a sense of, well, yes, it's a good idea that we send, uh, in effect, cultural ambassadors to Eastern Europe, but who is Glenn Gould and why should we risk our reputation on whoever he is? And it's really a combination of Walter Homburger's persistence plus the gradual further attention to uh, Gould's musical genius that counteracts this sort of resistance. Initially at least, uh, there's very little risk because the mood is, is a fairly quiet one. Unfortunately, that mood changes considerably. In the fall of uh, 1956, there's the combination of the Suez Crisis, and then almost uh, at the same time, the Soviet suppression of the Hungarian revolt. Suddenly, there's all sorts of doubt as to whether it's a good idea to send a Canadian performing artist to the Soviet Union so soon after a uh, major political confrontation. To Canadian Embassy, Washington, USA. While we have assured Mr. Gould that barring unforeseen developments in our relations with the Soviet Union during the next few months, we would have no objection to his going ahead with his plans to visit the USSR. There remains some doubt in our minds as to what might be the United States' reaction. The fundamental concern was that his ability to tour and, and perform in the United States not in any way be jeopardized by appearing in the Soviet Union at this time of tension. Obviously, that was a concern both to the department, but also especially to Walter Homburger and to Gould himself. And that assurance was received informally, and so the tour was able to go ahead. Glenn Gould, 24, has become the first North American concert pianist to be invited and to accept an invitation to perform in the Soviet Union. Dear Suzanne, in two weeks I will be off for Russia now that it is so close, it seems rather hard to believe. 
But if my stomach holds up with the Russian food, I imagine that I shall have a really fascinating time. Certainly it was an adventure, but at that stage in his life, Glenn liked the challenge, obviously. For all his problems, his anxieties, his nervousness about his physical health and so on. Dear Mrs. Ford, it is comforting to know that you have written to Moscow about my cereals and all the other things. Rest assured that I shall remember you with each shredded wheat. Well, he never got over the anxiety of traveling, being somewhere. Dear Dr. Moffat, I'm enclosing an envelope in which I hope that you will be so kind as to return a copy of the prescription which you gave me for some small yellow pills of some sedative property. These pills were extremely effective and I would like to have a refill to take with me to Europe next week. It was Vnukova airport that he arrived. We had a marvelous girl whose name was Henrietta Valeva. She was really a charmer. Her duty, I think, as much as being interpreter, was also to be explainer of anything that might cause doubts in our mind. I saw Glenn coming down the stairs. It was very hot in Moscow. He had hat, overcoat, scarf, and gloves on his hands. I was quite amazed that he didn't show his hand to shake. We came to the car and went right to Moscow. We came to the hotel. There was a beautiful apartment for him. Glenn looked at the bedroom, touched, and he said, no, I cannot live here. I say, what's wrong? Any, any problem? He said, yes, there is a big problem indeed. I used to sleep on double bed. But this one consists of two beds joined together and there is, <laughs> you know, so I cannot sleep here. And he said, never mind, let's call the embassy. So we went to the embassy and Glenn stayed at the embassy for the rest of his staying in Moscow. A difficult country we lived in the Soviet Union. Extremely difficult. A tremendous dictatorship where the authorities tried and very often succeeded in controlling everything, physically and mentally, everything. The Cold War was at its climax. It was 1957, and we were at a crossroad. And we didn't know whether we would go back to the Stalinist way or the new way. Just four years that Stalin died, it was a blackout, I would say, deep blackout, coma of the society. First foreigners that came here as artists created sensation by themselves, just by appearance. So what was happening in the 50s in the world? 
in its cultural life. A different culture was just arriving. There was already a layer in this culture that allows us to call the 50s for sure an anti-romantic era. The era of emerging intellectualism. But what was the situation he arrived into? In the Moscow Piano School, traditions of the so-called romantic pianism were still very much alive. This is Glinka, Mikhail Ivanovich Glinka, a nocturne called The Parting. This is typical Russian music, romantic, even slightly sentimental. I don't think that we are talking about a crisis of that traditional pianism, or the performing art as a whole. But there was some anticipation. How to find a figure in the world of pianism who would represent this new perspective, this new culture of thought. And here came Gould and showed that such culture was possible at the keyboard. Glenn's name was quite unknown. Nobody ever heard him playing, never heard any records because there were none before. And he came to the Soviet Union, bringing his first record, Goldberg Variations. My girlfriend and I went to the Grand Hall of the Conservatory, as usual, to see what posters were up. And we saw Glenn Gould, Canada. And my friend says, look, the art of the fugue. You know, let's go. No one plays the art of the fugue. Because Bach was practically banned. Bach. 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 His music was not allowed because it contained evangelist themes. It was considered to be church music. So we arrived. There were very few people. Half of the main floor and just a few people on the balcony. Everyone knows the G Bach is genius, you know, but really, frankly speaking, listen three hours of Bach, it's not my cup of tea. Because it's boring. A pale young man walked out onto the stage. His face immediately overwhelmed us. He sat on a low chair, so low that we were astonished. of exhilaration and, 
and something new. Впечатление было от него как от какого-то марсианина. The impression was that he was from Mars, an alien. His articulation and inhuman evenness, a perfection which seemed unreal. You felt that you were in the presence of a person totally absorbed in his strange and enigmatic world. Uh, who was also at the same time in total control of what he was doing. Everybody was in shock and first of all ran to the phones to call their friends so they could at least come to the second half. Around nine or maybe a bit later my classmate calls me. Immediately leave everything and come to the Grand Hall. I understood that something extraordinary was taking place. I got dressed and I ran. And I saw that from every direction people were hurrying to the Grand Hall for the second half of the concert. During the intermission, everybody was calling. The intermission lasted 40 or 50 minutes. In the second half, the hall was full. We were allowed to applaud something is not Soviet. And it's a great feeling of liberation. By intermission, bravos could be heard all over the hall. As Gould took a second bow, a huge basket of blue chrysanthemums was carried up the aisle towards the stage. The great hall was jammed with many well-known composers, conductors and pianists, as well as diplomats. Sustained applause, numerous curtain calls, and a basket of flowers greeted. May 8, 1957, 11.59 p.m., Moscow time. Concerts, great success. Staying at embassy, am in good health. Love, Glenn. I remember I didn't go to the first concert, but I remember that onslaught, that wave which went over the musicians. Did you hear what happened? A pianist from Canada had arrived. Simply a miracle. They assign um, your opposite number to review you. If you are a pianist from North America, they will assign a, another pianist in Russia to review you. I was reviewed, among other people, by the director of the Moscow Conservatoire, by Tatyana Nikolaeva, who is the most famous Russian woman pianist, and by uh, Professor Nagels, who is uh, the teacher, no less, of Gilels and Oystra, and, uh, and Richter. Soviet Culture Newspaper, May 9, 1957. Glenn Gould is a magnificent and a unique musician who possesses a profound understanding and a wonderful mastery of polyphony. Pianist Tatyana Nikolaeva. Soviet listeners will await with great interest further meetings with this talented musician, the representative of a country whose musical culture we still know so little about, Professor Genry Nigaus. Tchaikovsky Hall. It didn't inspire him as well as Moscow Conservatory. It has different atmosphere. The Tchaikovsky Hall always had terrible acoustics for all pianists. I played there many times. The sound drowns. It is very difficult to play there. He was the only pianist who sounded good in the Tchaikovsky Hall. His piano sang. His staccato was singing. And the Goldberg variations. They were totally overwhelming. The polyphony was miraculously beautiful. He could hear everything, all of the voices, as if all this was guided by a divine power. 
It was unbelievable, the reception that he received at the Tchaikovsky Hall. It was a storm. And in a way, it assured him that everything is fine. The Russian pianist Sviatoslav Richter was seen to applaud and cheer long after the general public had become exhausted. Afterwards, he congratulated Gould and thanked him for recreating Bach so magnificently. I had the very wonderful and very exciting experience of hearing Richter, who has been talked about a great deal in North America. In fact, he is probably the most mysterious pianist behind the Iron Curtain today. I heard Richter uh, play a concert which was simply a, a fantastic experience. I will tell you something that no one knows because it was from my intimate conversation with Sviatoslav Richter. All of a sudden he said, you know, I could play Bach as well as Gould. But you know why I don't play as well as he does? Because I would have to work so hard to play like him. This is the key to the genius of Glenn Gould. And the Viennese group, Webern, Schenick, and so on. That group we hardly knew of. But when Glenn Gould played them, it became clear to everyone that it was really wonderful, that we should pay a lot of attention. So he discovered the Viennese composers for us. I gave a lecture, uninvited more or less, at the um, Moscow Conservatory and subsequently repeated it at Leningrad on loosely called music in the West, but in point of fact I dealt almost entirely with the Viennese school, 12-tone composers. And um, this was a real cause celeb. Uh, a couple of old professors got up and led a demonstration by walking out because it had not my text had not been announced, needless to say. This, I think, was the most exciting and the most memorable part of the Russian trip. That's what Glenn played a little bit, the Berg Sonata. Yeah. The fact that the uh, conservatory, the authorities of the conservatory allowed him to make a speech about this music and uh, play this music was quite something. I mean, they, they probably felt difficult to stop it. I mean, they, they must have consulted the Ministry of Culture and other people in the party and they said, well, if it's only in the small hall in the conservatory, okay, let it be. This place was full of people. Everyone here was expecting a miracle. I think this is how it looked. There was an impression that in a concentration camp, the most terrible one, the most cruel, there was a little gathering place where they brought in the young prisoners. Generals, colonels, officers were watching from the front rows. There were prison guards, that's for sure. These were the young Communist League informers who were watching the behavior of others. The behavior of those who were welcoming this first infiltrator from the bourgeois world with excitement and with open souls. The earliest works of Schoenberg and Berg, Kautinaki, were also 
to a certain extent, without form. Right away, this was a shock. Because you should not be surprised in a concentration camp. And when he started to announce Schoenberg, Webern, and Berg again, and when he got to Schen, it is a composition by the Czechoslovakian composer Ernst Schen. In the hall, the young communists started to ask each other, what did he say? What did he say? Schenik. Schenik. And in the audience, people started to say, Schenik, Schenik. This was the password for an entirely new comprehension of life. We simply didn't know him. And of course, Gould was the first to reveal this world to us. The Berlin Wall existed in music as well. And perhaps Gould was one of those who were breaking that law. I was born in 58. Naturally, I became familiar with Gould through his recordings on the Melodia label. His first recordings produced a positive shock. It was Gould's specific influence on the way of thinking, on the mentality, on the reflexes of a pianist. The most important thing that separates him from the others is that he is a loner. He is by himself. And in this he finds an army of admirers, outsiders as well, for whom the world around them is not as important as the state of the soul. Southwood Drive, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Dear Banquo, thought you might like to know about the dogs here. One sees very few indeed. Most of them were killed in the war, and since that time it seems to be considered very bourgeois to keep a pet. The most prevalent variety is a sort of unclipped poodle, a few mongrels and no collies whatsoever. You would have the field all to yourself if you were here. You would have been able to break up a cat fight outside my window this morning. Clean up your dish like a good dog. When we came to Leningrad, we stayed at uh, the Yevropeyskaya Hotel, which is across the street from the Philharmonia Hall. When we came to the concert hall, Glenn said, it is terribly cold here. I need some heating. When he came to rehearse, it was a heater, electrical heater, standing by the piano. When he started to play, he noticed immediately something very unusual. It was a visual difference, because I've never seen a pianist playing like that. <laughs> That's the way he was playing. You have to know the musicians of St. Petersburg. The amazement of their Moscow colleagues does not mean anything to them. They have their own impressions of everything in the world, and their own opinions of everything in the world. That's why we miss Gould's first concert. 
Why did I go to his first concert at the Philharmonic Hall? Because the program was Bach. Not too many musicians then dared to perform such unpopular programs. One way or the other, I ended up at the Philharmonic. The hall was not even half full. I was to that concert to hear Alvin Burke. But I hear Bach, as new to me and as modern as Alvin Burke would have been. And then the madness began. Musical Leningrad was consumed by the excitement. It was in a state of climax. The second concert of Gould was in the Mali Hall of our Philharmonic. concert hall to, in attempt to buy tickets, uh, but it wasn't possible. I decided to go to the concert anyway, but when I approached uh, the street, it was blocked by policemen and horses blocking access to the doors. in Leningrad, the hall held about 1,400 people. But uh, there was a d very great demand for tickets, and so over and above fire regulations, they admitted 1,100 standees. <laughs> I mean, this was, was something fantastic. If anyone had fainted, they would have had no place to clap. Musically, it was absolutely great. I heard many great players, some of them poets, some of them brilliant technicians, some of them... Uh, classical musicians like say like uh, like Gillens, Emil Gillens. But I've never witnessed a piano player performer who's creating a sculpture in front of you. Now, 44 years later, I absolutely earnestly believe that he was an alien. Glenn Gould was a visitor on this earth. People cannot play the piano like that, I can assure you. I'm a very bad tourist, you know. I tend to get like a horse with blinders on when I am in places where I'm supposed to admire because of their scenic beauty. I really did a bit of sightseeing there because that was like, so much like being on the other side of the moon that not to take advantage of it would have been a catastrophe. But there again, I, d I didn't see nearly as much as I wanted to. But I, I wandered around quite a bit, and quite freely, unrestricted. He could find time to go out and walk in the streets. And we went to Hermitage. And we walked along embankments. I could feel that he was absorbing the beauty of the city. I think the excitement of the trip was partly he wanted to discover what was happening, what was going on. As a matter of fact, there was one man in Leningrad, I think, his name was Dmitry Tolstoy, who um, showed me a number of his piano works. And uh, the ones I saw were rather on the scale of, of uh, 
Brahms into Metzi. They were rather brief works, but wonderfully devised kind of an intense um, post-romantic harmonic craftsmanship. Really very impressive. I am pleased. I am proud of this. I am proud that a wonderful musician, a great musician, had thoughts which resonated with mine. That he understood and felt what I wanted to give people. It was not even a concert in the Mali Hall. It was Gould's meeting with the professors and students of the Leningrad Conservatory. I think Gould intended to give a lecture on the new Viennese school. He showed us the beginning of Webern's Pasakali for Orchestra Opus 1. He played eight notes separately and raised his hands up eight times. And after that he played Variations, Opus 27 and the audience started to submerge into a strange state. Students are a straightforward crowd. They started to express their confusion and demanded that he play Bach. And so he did. But it was clear that he was a little disappointed for very obvious reasons. He wanted to elevate us a little, and instead we pulled him down. But then we understood and realized that the musical world was comprised of more than what we had known and used. And to this day, I feel and I see how this was happening and how it was entering our soul and our musical consciousness. We know how the uh, Russians reacted to you with immense enthusiasm. Uh, how did you react to them? Well, and needless to say, this is one of the most exciting two weeks I've ever spent. The trip to the Soviet Union made news, a great deal of news. And that was a different kind of celebrity for Glenn. I'm going back to Europe for about six months, the latter half of 1958. And also, I hope to go back to Russia. Oh, very good. If you repeat your success with them there, you'll become a very important emissary in lowering the temperature of the Cold War. Well, that's a rule I'd like to have very much. That was a big event in his life. And I suppose you could say that it was the biggest adventure in his life. He became a real superstar at that point. And part of that was thrilling, exciting, and yet it didn't change him fundamentally at all. It seems to me that Gould was very touched by the warmth uh, of the Russians, especially those people who worked with him closely, continued to write to him and to keep in touch with him. And Gould himself paid them with the same warmth and generosity. To Madame Kitty Gvozdova, Leningrad Conservatory of Music, I cannot tell you what a great joy it was to receive your very kind wishes at the new year. I often think of the exciting day we spent with the students and professors in Leningrad. It was undoubtedly one of the memorable times of my life. Dear Mr. Glenn, you don't mind me calling you Mr. Glenn for you being so young and dearest because you really are one. You can't imagine the effect, the cheers, the happiness, and the overwhelming joy your sweet response produced upon me, my colleagues, and our students. 
We hope to see you again and again in Leningrad, giving us unspeakable emotions and pleasure by your marvelous recitals. We can compare to no one else. All of us are longing for your photos, photos where we shall be able to distinguish your charming traits with a few words and an inscription too. Yours forever, Kitty Govazdova. Glenn was aware that we'd moved into a new time in history. He knew he was living in a world filled with risk and danger, physical danger for the planet, for people on the planet. Music for Glenn was a way of entering the world of the unknown, the world of the perhaps unknowable, but you could aspire to sensing it, perhaps expressing some of it through music particularly. that uh, Gould's uh, voyage to Russia was as a great revelation for Gould himself as it was for the Russians. After his Russian trip, Gould began exploring Russian history, Russian music, and Russian literature, and even Russian politics. Music and all the arts, runs the theme, are always the symbols, the reflections of their time. Therefore, an epoch of social progress will be reflected in music of great vitality, and an era of social stagnation will be reflected in music of a decadent, dilettantish nature. Soviet society rejects the critical faculty of art, the possibility that the artist will and should disapprove of the socialist state. It is almost impossible to pick up a newspaper or magazine these days without finding some dispatch about the current crisis in the arts of the Soviet Union. There was the occasion a few months back when Mr. Khrushchev, taken for his first view of an exhibit of abstract art, responded, as have many other frustrated viewers, East and West, by suggesting that a cow's tail slapped across a canvas could do a better job. Within a matter of days, the Ministry of Culture chimed in with a reminder that abstraction had never been considered beneficial to the interests of the Soviet people, that it was a decadent tendency of bourgeois society. I'm so glad that Gould found an urge in his inner world to stand up um, against such uh, stupidities in the Soviet Union. It's natural for a mind of the depths that uh, Gould had. Um, he probably had no choice but to speak up and say what he thought about it. Gould now began taking personally what was happening to Russian people. He tried to help them as much as he could, at least to make the Westerners aware of the circumstances and conditions in which uh, the Soviets had to work and to create. I had not known that Gould protested and acted. I am thankful to him. Everything was behind an iron curtain. And it's even more curious that he was striving to understand Russia. He wasn't interested in Russian music on its own, but as part of the Russian history, its philosophy, its spiritual mentality. This is a rarity for a musician. Despite all of the idiotic repressions of Soviet musical life, despite all of the absurd restrictions of the official policy of the arts, at a time of international 
as well as personal crisis, that superb, impassioned lyricism of the Russian character will still respond with achievements of mesmeric power. Soviet Music Journal by Professor Dmitry Blagoy. His motivations are entirely different from those of a musical nature. His judgments reveal Glenn Gould's true political sympathies and antipathies, which demolish to the core our image of him as a pure artist. These views are a logical product of the so-called Free West. Blagoy's article in the Soviet music was made to order. It was a curious example of the time, when substance and truth did not matter. Everything was dominated by the political doctrine of that time. It's simply unintelligent to attack a musician for his personal opinion. Glenn Gould had a very interesting mind. Um, he had his own world, of course. His truth was the deep truth of a man who was not threatened by ideological oppression. He was free. Gould was free. Mr. Gould, I study the keyboard music of Renaissance and Baroque era. Unfortunately, it's impossible to get your recordings here. Please, send me copies of your recordings. I shall make copies and return all materials safe and sound quickly. Excuse me, my bad English. Sincerely yours, Victor Frolkin, City of Krasnodar, State Institute of Culture. Interesting. The interest was huge. We were always waiting for new recordings by Gould. I arranged meetings and lectures about Gould. Radio programs. I wrote papers. We published Gould's lecture at the Moscow Conservatory. We started to live by each new recording of Gould. And until his death, his life became part of our life. This is what we lived by. And when Gould died, we were terribly distraught. It was like something living was torn. The after effect of visit of Glenn Gould in Russia may be even more important than the visit itself. It was a fertile soil for everything new, new in poetry, new in literature, new in music, in movie, in theater. Gould 
сломал эту границу. Gould broke down a border at this time, at the level of performing arts. And he won a lot of admirers who understood that this culture was more important for the 20th century than what was associated with the official culture of socialist realism. It is difficult to imagine a person who studies Bach in Russia without listening to Gould. I cannot imagine that. If I am teaching, I surely tell the students, you have to listen to Gould. Certainly, it is simply impossible without him. I understand that Gould's inner energy had a colossal influence. I think I'm not the only Russian musician who lives with this. I think this is an enormous influence. It spans two or three generations of musicians in Russia. He's the great uh, painter of sound and the poet of music. He's uh, so different than anybody that is special. He's a special and he's good. <laughs> Gould helps me to organize my mind and my brain. And he helps me, helps me to understand better the music, Bach's music, and other music too. I don't know, maybe it's, uh, it's impossible, but I, I want to play like, uh, like good. I think he will never leave us. There may be some changes in moods, but he will remain the greatest communicator between Bach and our time. For me, uh, certainly a, an idol, there's no question about it, whom I couldn't emulate, because I'm a totally different character, too. And, um, but I think it's wonderful that such an extraordinary man, extraordinary talent existed and gave us a fascinating way of playing Bach, especially. There is God, who suddenly mocks one person. This person comes from Canada, from Toronto, and changes the musical climate throughout the world. Dear Mr. Glenn, your future sojourn in our city has become quite an obsession, the favorite desire of every member of the Leningrad Conservatory, as well as of every Leningradian who had luck to listen to your performances. Do come indeed, dear, beloved, incomparable, charming maestro from the enchanting world of fairy tales. Our Poet of the Piano. <laughs> 